Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I think uh, some of them have uh, joined the uh, Supernatural R, so they haven't yet joined class. Okay, John Paul is here. Thank you, John, for leading worship this morning. Hey, praise God. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> morning, Anita. Good morning, everyone. It's Friday, so I think people will slowly be... Uh, you know, joining class. So we we'll just wait for a couple of minutes before we begin. We're all excited that it's going to be the weekend. Yes, no? Or is your weekend as busy, as rushed as the week is? Good morning. Okay, we'll uh, we'll begin. Uh, in the meantime, as we pray, people will join in. So, one can some of one of you lead us in prayer, please. Can anyone lead us in prayer this morning? Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for today. You have given us, Lord. Lord, whatever we are learning about your doctrines, Lord, whatever we are going to learn from your word, Lord, Lord, it should be added to our knowledge and Lord our knowledge and learning and it should be implemented and used for the kingdom special lord all glory be to given to you O lord lord we don't want to show anything lord we don't want to do show off but we are learning lord so that we can expand your kingdom lord the great commission you have given us lord the learning can be added into this and lord we can do your work lord with the mighty and in with the mighty hands lord Lord, protect us, provide us. Lord, give us your fear and knowledge so that we can understand all the things which are being taught. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. What do you think? We'll uh, wait for a couple more minutes because there's only uh, six of you in class. We just wait for uh, two more minutes. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. So what do you have in the second and third hour today? Uh, believers Authority, was Nancy. Okay. okay. Uh, did I mention when we are going to have our uh, test for doctrinal foundations? You mentioned Last 14th week? of February. Yeah, that is for uh, doctrinal foundations or systematic theology. Uh, I think I mentioned that for systematic Christology. theology, right? You mean Christology or... Uh... Oh, sorry, Christology, yes. <laughs> yeah, Christology, uh, yeah. So I mentioned that for Christology, right? For 14 Feb? Yes. Okay. So we need to uh, also decide a date for uh, uh, systematic theology for doctrinal foundations. So we basically have a lot of chapters is yeah so we have 11 chapters we'll do three tests so we can have a test even in systematic theology So we'll finish the Doctrine of Trinity and then maybe have a test. Is that all right? Can we have the first four chapters? Okay. So which date would you suggest?
for systematic for uh, for systematic theology yes because you're having a test on uh, uh, Christology on December 14th. So when do you want to have a test for uh, doctrinal foundations for systematic theology? Any date would you like to suggest? Do you like to have it on March 4th? Yeah, okay. What about the others? Thank you, John. It's okay? Okay, okay, ma. Okay. So then we'll have a test on uh, uh, in systematic theology, doctrinal foundations, the first four chapters. And we'll have that on Friday, uh, the 4th of March. Okay. Okay, we'll uh, begin. Thank you for patiently waiting for the others to join. Okay, last class we uh, began uh, the lesson on the doctrine of uh, Trinity. Okay, and we said that it's one of uh, the most important doctrines of the Christian faith. Okay, so we'll just do a quick recap. Uh, a good recap of what we learned uh, last class. Uh, so is the word Trinity found in the Bible? You all can uh, type your answers in the chat or you can unmute your mics and answer. Is the word Trinity found in the Bible? No? Okay. So uh, yes, it's the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but is the teaching or the concept or the doctrine of Trinity mentioned in the Bible? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so what does the word Trinity mean? What does the word Trinity mean? I'm not asking the definition for the doctrine of Trinity. I'm asking you what does the word Trinity mean? Trinity. What does the word Trinity mean? Okay, tri unity, which means tri is three. So, what does it mean? Three, three in, in unity. Yep. Okay. Three in oneness. Yes, thank you, Anita. So, it's uh, three in unity or uh, three in um, oneness, okay? Um, and it's used to summarize the teaching of scripture that God is uh, three persons, yet one God, okay? So how do we define the doctrine of Trinity? What is the definition for the doctrine of Trinity? What is the definition for the doctrine of Trinity? Or what does Trinity mean? Three persons, one essence. Okay, quite rhyming, rhyming. three persons, one essence. Okay. How do we define Trinity? God eternally exists as three persons. Okay, thank you. Very important for us to know the definition of Trinity. Anyone else would like to try? Okay, Trinity is one God who eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God. 
okay? Or you can say one God who revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God. Okay, I'll repeat that again. Uh, God is one. He eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God. Or you can say there is one God who revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God. Okay, We see that uh, the doctrine of Trinity is uh, progressively uh, revealed uh, throughout Scripture. Uh, so is the doctrine of Trinity mentioned only in the New Testament, or is it present even in the Old Testament? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. Yeah, Pia, uh, that poetry appears in both the New and the Old Testament. In fact, it's all over Scripture, all everywhere in the Scriptures. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, Subhashis. It's in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's found throughout Scripture. Uh, so we looked at um, uh, the doctrine of Trinity as it's found in the in the Old Testament. Um, uh, and we see that, you know, if it's not mentioned in the Old Testament, then uh, there will be something that's really wrong. Uh, and it will be surprising because if God eternally exists as three persons, as we define Trinity, you know, it will be surprising that we find no indications of it in the Old Testament. So, yes, it's uh, mentioned both in the Old and New Testament. Uh, we looked at a few passages in the Old Testament which suggest or imply that God exists as more than one person. And we also looked at a few passages in the New Testament where we saw Trinity in action or we saw Trinity that is named together. We saw that the Trinity is named together in certain passages in the New Testament. And then we moved on uh, and, and I mentioned uh, three statements uh, which summarize the biblical teaching on the Trinity. Do you remember the three statements that I said, uh, with which we summarize the biblical teachings on Trinity. Anyone remember the three statements? God is a three person. Thank you. God is three persons. That's the first statement. Second statement, Each anyone person. else remembers? And when was the second and the third one? God is three Each persons. Person. The first statement. Yes. Sorry, John. Each person is fully God. Each person is fully God. Thank you. Yes, Lubega. Thank there you. is only one God. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lubega. There is only one God. And thank you, Subhashish, for your answer. Each person is fully God and there is only one God. Okay. So those are the three statements that uh, we uh, that I mentioned to summarize uh, the biblical teaching on Trinity. So God is three persons uh, and uh, he is one and each one of them are fully God. So God is three persons, which means that Father is not the Son. Okay, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. Each one of them are distinct persons. And uh, we saw a couple of passages which show us that they are distinct persons. Uh, persons and they are mentioned as distinct persons. Okay, the second statement which I said was that each person is fully God. Okay, we saw uh, in through Scripture, you know that uh, God the Father is clearly God, as it's mentioned in Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, we also saw that Jesus, uh, who is the Son, 
Jesus Christ, who is the Son, He is fully God. And um, we looked at the passages in John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4 and verse 14. Uh, we all know this, the scripture because we've been looking at it uh, a couple of times the last few weeks. And then we looked at, um, you know, God, the Holy Spirit is also fully God. Uh, the Great Commission where, uh, you know, it's mentioned about the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. We also saw the incident in Acts chapter 5 with uh, Ananias and Sapphira, the couple uh, who go to Peter and um, how he, Peter said, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. How can you lie to the Holy Spirit? And then in verse 5, he says, you've lied not to man, but to God, and as, hence equating, you know, Holy Spirit as God himself, okay? Uh, so we see that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three of them, you know, possess the whole being of God in themselves. That means each one of them are God. Uh, so when we speak of uh, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit together, we we know and we think uh, and we understand that they are a supreme being. There is no one greater than them. There's no one who's supreme than they are, and they are supreme beings. So similarly, when we speak of them individually, we also, you know, uh, have the same understanding that each one of them are supreme beings as well. So even when we think of them together, or we just speak about God, we know that there is no one other than him who is supreme. Um, and similarly, when we speak of each one individually as well, we also have this understanding that uh, that they are the supreme being, hence they are God, okay? And then there is the last uh, statement, which we said there is one God. And where do we uh, have this in the Bible? Where does the Bible mention that there is only one God? In Deuteronomy. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter and verse, please. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses. 4 and 5. Okay. So uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And we also have that in Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 and uh, 6. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, we read, uh, God says here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 and 6, uh, God says, I am the Lord and there is no other, there is no God besides me. Okay, so we see that uh, God is only one being and uh, there is no three gods and we don't believe in three gods. Okay, uh, but we believe in one God who uh, eternally existed or revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So how is God one? When we say we believe there is one God, how do we and there are three persons? How do uh, we understand or how is God one? He is one in essence. Thank you. Uh, he is God, one God in essence. Uh, and what is the meaning of essence? Means being. being. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shubhashis. Uh, essence means a being. Uh, it's the same thing as being. Uh, okay, so God is one in essence. So how is God three? How is God three? He's three in persons. Yes, thank you, Shubhash. So God is one in essence. Essence is the same thing as being. And uh, how is God three? He is three in persons. Um, and, we, and I said uh, before I ended class last, uh, uh, in the last class, that essence and person are not the same thing. Uh, God is one in essence and he's three in three different persons. Um, and uh, we also said that uh, Trinity is not a contradiction. Why is it not a contradiction?
why is Trinity not a contradiction? No answers? Okay, Trinity is not a contradiction because we're saying there is one God who eternally existed or revealed himself in three persons, but it would be a contradiction if we say that God is three in the same way that he is one. So if we say there's three gods in the same day that he is, and we say there is one God, then there is a contradiction, but uh, the fact that there is one God and one in essence, and there are three persons, shows us that Trinity is not a contradiction, okay? And all three persons are one uh, God because all three of them have the same essence, um, and there is only one being and not three beings. There are not three gods, okay? And then we ended class by saying that we will look today at uh, what it means uh, by the word essence and person, uh, how these two uh, terms differ and how they relate with each other. And uh, by knowing that, we will have a complete understanding of Trinity. Okay, so what does the word essence mean? Uh, it just simply means uh, being, okay? Um, so God's essence is his being. Uh, to be even more precise, uh, uh, essence is basically who God is. Uh, now, when we say uh, it is who God is, we actually uh, you know, take the risk of sounding uh, too physical, but uh, it's not just the physical appearance or the outward appearance, but it's basically essence uh, should be understood or can be understood as what God consists of, okay? What God consists of. Uh, we cannot understand uh, this in a more physical way uh, about God because we know that God is spirit. Uh, you know, when we talk about essence, when we talk about being, uh, you know, in our understanding as human beings, we think about something that is more physical, uh, being who we are, what we are made up of. Uh, so I said that, you know, essence can also be understood as what God consists of, uh, but, you know, we cannot understand it in a very physical way because we know that God is spirit. Uh, we read about this in John chapter 4, verse 24. Um, and further, we clearly should not think of God as, you know, consisting of anything other than divinity, okay? Uh, so he's, he's God and he, you know, consists of uh, only that which makes up divinity and he does not consist of anything other than divinity. Um, the very being of God, the very substance of God is God, Okay, it's not a bunch of ingredients or it's not putting together of uh, certain aspects or certain, uh, you know, uh, 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 certain um, things that would, you know, yield deity. But we know that the very being or the very substance of God is God himself. Uh, uh, the very the core being of who he is is God, and so we cannot say that you know it's putting of things together of uh, of uh, divine and human nature together to uh, to bring about deity. But when we are talking about uh, the substance of God, it is who God is. Okay, or we say when God consists of, he consists of nothing other than uh, God Himself or His Him being deity or him being uh, God himself, okay? So that is the meaning of uh, essence. Basically, it is uh, what God consists of, and he basically consists of himself, that is God. He is God, and he does not consist of ingredients that is put together to yield deity, but he is God himself. Now, what does person mean? Uh, now, when we're talking about this word person, we're not going to be looking at it or, under, or trying to understand it uh, with the way that we understand, uh, uh, with the way I understand other persons or other people. 
okay uh, we, we we need to understand this word or this term uh, person with regard through the uh, trinity okay so with regard to the trinity we use the term person in a very uh, different way than we would generally use it in everyday life so with regard to trinity uh, it's very difficult uh, to have a, a a real a solid or a complete definition of this uh, word person okay uh, but what we do not mean by person is an independent individual in the sense that uh, uh, you know uh, me and Aradna or me or Zilotoli are completely different individuals. Uh, we are uh, we have a different uh, emotional set makeup. We have a different physical makeup. We have a different intellectual makeup, um, and we exist apart from each other. So Aradna is very different from Zilotoli, and is you know and they all they both are different from me, and we are uh, you know we exist apart from each other we are not coexisting together we are very independent uh, individuals okay and we are separate human beings so when we think about persons in uh, with a human understanding each one of us are individual personalities and we exist apart from each other okay but in the trinity uh, the father is a different person the son is also a different person with regard to the father uh, and the Holy Spirit is also a complete different person. Uh, but when we see, uh, you know, uh, uh, the father regards himself as I and he regards the son as you or he regards the Holy Spirit as you. Okay, so we see that the father is a different person from the son because he regards the son as you, even though he regards himself as I. So when we look at Trinity or in regard to Trinity, we can say that, uh, you know, each person means a distinct subject with regards to I and you. Uh, and these distinct or these separate subjects are not divisions within the being of God, but they are a, a form of personal existence other than the difference in being. Okay, so like I explained, uh, Zilotoli, Aradna, and I are, you know, we exist apart from each other, but in the Trinity, uh, they are different persons but they are, you know, um, they are just one being, okay? There is one God, but they are separate, uh, different uh, individuals, separate, distinct, separate subjects, and hence they have the same being. They are not a division in the being of God, but they have the same being. Uh, uh, they are one, but, you know, uh, they are different persons, okay? So that sounds a little philosophical or a little difficult to understand, but I hope you are able to gather what I'm saying. Yes, no? Yes, Pastor. Okay, thank you, John. What about the others? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is, you know, where we can't understand Trinity or the, pers uh, the word persons with regard to Trinity in the way we understand uh, each other or in our everyday life or our, with our human limitations and our understanding, uh, we, uh, we can't regard this uh, word uh, uh, or define this word person with regard to Trinity in our human understanding because uh, when we think of persons with our human understanding, each one of us are separate, uh, you know, we exist apart from each other. But when we talk about persons in Trinity, uh, each one of them are distinct subjects, each one of them are different because the Father says, refers himself to as I, and he refers to the Son and the Holy Spirit as you. Uh, but when we look at three, three of them, three persons, each one of them have the same being, okay? They are not divisions in the being. That means they're not divisions in the being of God. They are one, uh, but they, uh, you know, uh, uh, reveal themselves or uh, exist as three different persons, but they are just one being, 
but in the human uh, understanding we are all three different like i mentioned aradhana zyotoli and myself we are three different beings we are uh, we exist apart from each other but when god they all exist together they are one but they are separate persons okay i hope that is uh, clear sidikeno you look very confused <laughs> your facial expressions uh okay so we will uh, move ahead uh, the only way it seems possible um, you know to say that the distinction between the person is not a difference in being um, but we can look at it in a like a difference in relationship okay uh, and this again is something very different from our human experience um, where every different human person is a different being as well uh but you know with god's being it's so much you know god as a being is so much greater than uh ours okay uh he is one yet he is undivided being um and there can be an also an unfolding of interpersonal relationship uh, so that they are three distinct persons okay so we can look at it as uh, uh they are one being but difference in relationships in the way they relate uh, to each other and we can just summarize this or we can understand it like this that god is uh, great he is infinite he is uh, uh you know he is uh, awesome he is mighty he is all powerful he is quite different from our human experience um and he's so much greater than our thinking our understanding uh, and hence we can think about it this way that you know he's one undivided being but within himself he can unfold into interpersonal relationships and hence there can be a uh, three distinct persons okay so what then is the difference between the father son and the holy spirit so basically there is no differences between them when it comes to attributes uh, because we said all three are god there is only one god each one of them have the same being they are one in essence uh, so they have or they consist of everything that makes them god um, so there's no difference in their attributes uh, it's the only difference we can say is in the way they relate to each other uh and to creation okay so uh we already saw what was the role uh, uh of the father son and the holy spirit in the previous classes uh so we see that there is a difference only in their relationship in the way they relate with each other and the way they relate with creation uh so we uh we know that uh, uh, the role of the father or the unique quality of the father is uh, uh, is in the way that he relates um, to the son and to the holy spirit uh the unique quality of the son is the way he relates as a son to the father uh and the unique quality of the holy spirit is the way the holy uh, spirit relates to the father to the son and to us as uh, well okay so beyond the existence of three persons in one god uh you know there is something beyond this is something beyond our understanding um so we see that uh, in christian theology they have come to use this word person uh, to speak of three differences in relationships um and it's not because we uh, fully understand what is meant by this word persons when we are referring to trinity uh, but it is rather so that we might say something instead of saying nothing okay so it's basically we human beings trying to understand comprehend this big mighty god we're trying to explain him or understand him in the way that he's revealed himself and so we've come up with these terms like trinity like uh, persons uh, essence being and all of that but uh, for god there is no confusion uh, for us it will be a little difficult for us to understand um, you know but um, uh, people have uh, 
try to bring about this understanding so that we can relate uh, better to God with God. We can uh, uh, we can relate better with uh, the three persons or the way God has revealed Himself in three persons in the Trinity, and for us to uh, also have a better, deeper uh, relationship with God. So there is no difference in uh, their attributes. It's only a difference in the relationship in the way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to each other, and also with their uh, roles and responsibilities okay so uh, how do they relate with each other now scripture shows us that each member of the trinity you know uh, uh, you know uh, fulfills a specific role uh, and it also reveals that these roles are interrelated, okay? Uh, they have to be interrelated. If they are not interrelated, then, you know, we are talking about three separate gods, uh, but it is uh, one God in being who, you know, uh, has uh, has the capacity to have this interpersonal relationship within his one being. Okay, so in simple terms, we see that the father is the creator, he's the one who plans, he's the supreme authority. Uh, the Lord Jesus is the one who implements the plan, uh, and the Holy Spirit is the one who administers the plan. And we basically have, uh, you know, spoken about this in uh, the previous classes. So the father is the one who's the supreme authority, who plans things, who creates a plan. The Lord Jesus implements the plan and the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, administers the uh, plan. Okay, uh, so the way of redemption uh, also shows us in a very clear manner these roles. Uh, the Father basically uh, designed or organized uh, how mankind should be redeemed. Uh, we read this in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Can somebody turn to that, please? Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and can somebody read that? And somebody else can turn to John chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. And uh, someone else can uh, turn to John chapter 14, verse 26. So can one of you read? Uh... Thank you. Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under, under the law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of the son. Thank you. So here we see that the Father has designed and organized how uh, mankind uh, would be redeemed. Um, and then uh, he set into motion, you know, a set of events, actions, and prophecies, uh, which culminated in the life and in the uh, the death of uh, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that the Son carried out the plan of the Father. Can one of you read John chapter six, verse thirty-seven and thirty-eight, please? All that the Father All gives that, me will yeah, come give me. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Abubak. Okay. All that as the Father give me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will know, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we see that the Son followed the Father's instructions to come to the earth, and um, even though it meant that he would have to take on the sins of the entire world and die on the cross. And then we see that the Holy Spirit ensures that every person uh, feels a call towards God's saving grace. Uh, we read this in John chapter 14, verse 26. Can somebody read that, please? But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Okay, thank you. We see that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is the one who convicts people also of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, we read that in John chapter 16. Um, and we also see that he, uh, you know, calls people towards God, towards his saving grace. And uh, furthermore, we see that he transforms the lives and the hearts of those who receive uh, salvation through 
Jesus Christ. So here we see, um, you know, the how they relate with each other. Okay, we see their roles in a very clear manner, and each one of them fulfilling their roles and responsibilities. And even within the roles and responsibilities, there's perfect unity and there's perfect um, oneness. Okay, and we can't even again try to understand or comprehend this uh, in our human understanding, the way we relate with people, uh, you know, uh, we can have the same roles and responsibilities in a church, but, you know, we can do things con very different. We can sometimes even not work together in unity and oneness, uh, you know, but here we see that um, uh, even though they have the same attributes, but they uh, relate to each other in a different way. They have different specific roles, but even within those roles, even that within those responsibilities, within that relationship, there is perfect unity because they are one. Okay, there is one God. We never see anywhere there is a, a disunity between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, showing us that there is no contradiction in Trinity because it is one God, and you know uh, who is just um, revealing Himself or who eternally exists is three persons. Okay. Um, so the person of the Trinity are not just three different ways of looking at one being of God. Um, okay, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we don't understand. Uh, and uh, it's something that is a mystery. Um, but it should not uh, like really bother us or trouble us because, you know, different aspects of this mystery is clearly being taught to us in scripture. Uh, yes, we are uh, finite beings, we are finite creatures. Uh, we are not omniscient deity we you know we are not all understanding or all knowing and hence there will be always uh, things uh, you know that we will not understand fully about this omniscient uh, god this omnipotent god or we something that we cannot understand of this infinite being because we are very finite and we are not omniscient deities okay but uh, some things uh, you know will remain a mystery to us but most of it has been uh, revealed uh, to us so we can have a clear understanding in in most aspects um, so it's uh, spiritually healthy uh, for us to acknowledge uh, openly that um, God's very being is you know far greater than we can even imagine comprehend or understand uh, but having said that you know uh, it humbles us before God uh, and it draws us to worship this, uh, you know, this great, mighty, awesome God uh, who's so great, uh, whose um, understanding knowledge is so vast, uh, whose revelations is uh, is so unlimited that our entire life, it is, you know, it's not sufficient for us for to fully understand uh, this great, uh, uh, awesome, mighty God. But, uh, you know, we are so grateful that he has revealed himself um, uh, to the extent that we can understand him, to the extent that we can relate to him, that we can uh, comprehend him in our own uh, finite uh, minds. Okay, so uh, even though we don't understand fully, and we'll never fully comprehend or gather together this whole aspect of Trinity. Uh, but whatever has been revealed to us is enough for our understanding, just for us to, you know, stand uh, uh, in humility before this great and mighty God, and also which will draw us to worship Him uh, without reservation, and also able to, you know, relate to Him in a better way, uh, and also, you know, able to draw from uh, who He is, uh, draw from his resources of what he's made available for us, um, draw from his um, his personality, his strength, uh, and the very fact that, you know, uh, there is God the Father who has a plan for us, uh, who's created everything perfect and uh, the plans he has for us are plans to prosper us and not harm us and uh, we don't have to you know we don't feel lost because we do not know what his plan is or his plan is not a mystery for us but we have uh, Jesus Christ who is there to uh, you know uh, reveal God's plan, the Holy Spirit reveals God's plans to us, and the Holy Spirit is there to help 
us, guide us, teach us, encourage us, um, you know, to lead us step by step into God's uh, great plan and purpose uh, for our life. So even as you try to understand Trinity, uh, one uh, God, three persons, and all of those things, you know, just try to understand that uh, his roles, what are each of their roles, their relationship with each one of us, uh, we can just maximize on that, uh, pull in that, pull our strength, get our strength from that, draw from that, and uh, continue uh, living our lives, uh, knowing that, you know, we have a father, who is uh, the one who is a perfect planner, who will execute his plan and purpose for our lives. We have Jesus Christ who will who is the word, who can we can speak the word, declare the word, and see things uh, uh, which uh, have already been destined for us in the supernatural, in the natural for us. And we can also be assured of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit who is there to teach us, guide us, and um, uh, reveal the mysteries, the truth, of God uh, to us and guide us each step of the way. Okay, so that is about Trinity. Any of you have uh, any questions, any doubts? Anything you'd like to ask? I hope you've understood the concept of essence, person, being. All of that? Yes, no? Anyone has any questions? The explanation is very clear, ma. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, go, go ahead. You have a question. Ma'am, I wanted to know, like in Genesis 1, 1, we see there are three forms of God. The God is in one essence. I was thinking when Jesus came, when the father came to visit Adam and Eve, in what form he came? Like they were able to see father, like in what form he would have come? Uh, what form? You know, uh, oh yeah, God, it, um, I think basically he would have, they heard the voice uh, of God, right? That is what uh, Genesis says, that they heard the voice of God. Uh, so, uh, and it also says in Timothy that no one, God lives in unapproachable light, no one has seen God, no one can ever see him. Uh, but understanding that, uh, you know, Adam and Eve were created in the likeness, in the image of God, uh, you know, um, so they wouldn't have seen any form of God because God is spirit, but basically heard his voice. That is what uh, is my understanding of what scripture says. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So we don't say what form he came in because God, uh, uh, you know, uh, God does not take on any form. Uh, you know, he reveals himself, which is people have heard him speak, but doesn't take on any form. Okay, so we say like form, then we talk about like, you know, uh, other religions that talk about other forms of God into which he reveals himself. Yeah. So basically, if we send somebody to be an angel, uh, come in the human form. Okay, that's what Abraham saw, Lot saw. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Anyone else has any questions? No questions? Okay, then um, uh, we'll end class. So we'll have uh, a test on um, systematic theology, doctrinal foundations. We'll have that on um, uh, March 4th. Uh, that's a Friday. And we will have the first four chapters, okay, till the doctrine of uh, Trinity. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class today. Have a good day and a good uh, weekend, a good refreshing weekend and see you all on Monday. Okay, bye. Bye-bye, ma. Thank you, ma.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you.